we're going to start this demo talking about the latest release that I did with Sizzix. I mean, like brand new because it's coming out uh, this month. I think they started shipping actually February 1st. So it's available in some stores already. This is going to be something that may not be new to many of you. Uh, it's just new to the Tim Holtz line with Sizzix because I wanted to make some modifications to uh, the tools that they had. But I want to introduce the tools because today's demo really revolves around this tool set. We're going to do a lot of inking and cutting and all sorts of things and hopefully give you some ideas for Valentine's Day and spring. So these two SKUs, and like I said, it may not be new to you. You may have a version of it in a different color. So I just want to explain like what they are and why I did this. So the first one, pretty basic. It's just a uh, dye brush and a dye pick. Again, nothing new. Uh, we'll just do it in black because I have some machines coming out with Sizzix this year. The Vagabond has been retired, so it's limited stock for those that were holding out to get a Vagabond. It's going away for good. Uh, and the machines coming out are black. So we started to do this whole black tool line to kind of go with it. Now, the only thing about a dye brush, of course, it comes with that little squishy pad. It's got this brush. It's got this little magnet thing. Let me pop it off. There you go. I don't know why it doesn't come pre-attached. Maybe some people don't want a magnet. So uh, when you go to attach this, here's just a little trick. Um, it's a friction fit on the bottom of this tool, but sometimes if you just try to push it on there, it doesn't want to go. So I just place it in the palm of my hand, take the end of that tool, and just kind of go in a circular motion. Watch that. There you go. You'll get that to click. So that's how I put on the magnet. Then, of course, a die pick. Now, the difference between a die pick and a craft pick, right? Because I have those tools with tonic. This is a different type of metal. This is a tempered steel and that is designed for like a digging or picking motion. So that's why I use a die pick in addition to a craft pick. A craft pick, like what I have with Tonic, is just more for you know picking out adhesive or poking holes, but if you're going to do that digging motion, especially out of a Biggs die, you wanna just take that, you can put that on the back, it's got that nice little rubber grip right there, and you can go in and pick things out. Another thing to keep in mind with the camera, because I do still use my iPhone for a camera, uh, the back will always be uh, blurred out and what I hold close hopefully would stay in focus. That's the goal here. So sometimes people get too distracted with what's in the back. All right. So that is the die pick and brush. Again, nothing earth shattering, but I still use both. And then we have the shaping kit. Now, Sizzix has had the shaping kit, well, for years. And, you know, no offense to Sizzix, but I was just never a fan of it because it contained things that I would never use. And it was just I don't know, it was an inconvenience to me, but I love the idea of the shaping kit. So when they approached me and said, you know, would you, would you consider doing this? Because I kept begging them, like, why don't you redo this and do this and do this? They're like, why don't you do your own version? I'm like, okay. So if you have the original Sizzix shaping kit um, that has extra pieces, it's the same tools, but it's just done in a different configuration, all right? So the whole benefit of a shaping kit is it's going to allow us to shape paper. Okay, you can shape other things, you can shape uh, foam, you can do UPO, you can do a lot of other things, but today I'm gonna focus on paper specifically. So the reason I wanna do this kit, first of all, this retails for $10 less than the Sizzix one, because obviously I removed some tools that I didn't need. The first one, of course, uh, I removed the scissors that came with theirs, because, well, for obvious reasons, I have uh, my own. But then they had things like a, a quilling tool, they had some little pick to it, and I really didn't want any of that. Here's Here's what I want. And by the way, I just store mine in a uh, Distress Crayon tin because it fits. Uh, you can keep yours in the package or in a bag or whatever you want. And the foam just kind of fits in. It's a little snug, but it works, All right? So here's what comes with this shaping kit. You get this pad. Now this pad is a very dense foam. I kind of say like, think of it like the bottom of a flip-flop. So not so squishy like fun foam, right? A little bit more dense, but it, so it definitely has some give but you need that sort of barrier for shaping. Then we have these guys. Now these are pure magic. And, and honestly, this is like a love-hate thing with people um, when it comes to tweezers. Some people like regular tweezers. And, and me, personally, I like these reverse tweezers. Um, reverse tweezers mean you have to squeeze them to get them to open. So I call them squeezers instead of tweezers because you have to squeeze to use them. But first, take a look at that point. Guys, it's like a needle sharp. So it's really good if you're going to like poke a little hole because you want to put a brad in there and you're going to use your squeezers for the brad anyway. Um, but the nice thing, it's got those little rubber grips right there so your fingers don't slip off of them. And they are very strong. And you're going to see why I use this. In fact, 
I use these instead of a quilling tool. I just don't use a quilling tool anymore. Well, one, because my eyes are just so bad, I can't get the paper into that crazy little slot and it just annoyed me. So when I had the opportunity to test out these squeezers, I'm like, bring it. And you'll see, you know, if you haven't tried them, I would say, give it a try before you say, nope, these are the only tweezers I use because you'll have a, probably a need for both kinds. But then, and then it does have this little plastic cap. That's important because these guys, as I mentioned, are super sharp. So there's that, okay? But this, this is the magic right here, okay? So these are round ball stylus. And again, nothing new to the art world. There's stylus that you can get uh, for clay. There's, you know, people use them for paper scoring, whatever that is. I just wanted these stylus tips specifically for shaping, these sizes. So you'll see uh, it's this really large ball. So there's a 10 millimeter, that's this guy. Okay, that's the big one. And then we go down to eight millimeter. Okay, so that's on that tool. So you got the two big guys there. And each side has that rubber grip. Another thing that's important, if you just use a regular stylus that doesn't have a comfort grip, your hands do get tired because you're doing repetition with this tool. So you needed it to be comfortable. Then when we go down to the other tool, we go to a five. This is a five millimeter. And then we go to this little tiny guy. This is a two, right? So we jump pretty, pretty significant from a five to two because I don't need all those sizes in between me personally, and hopefully you're going to see the benefit of what this is, right? So I don't need the other things, and that was what I wasn't a fan of on the other kit. Like all of my stylus weren't on the same tool. It was like a stylus and a quill, and then a stylus and a pick, and it's like, eh, just this is all I need, okay? So it's a very simple kit. Also, well, it just looks really nice because it's all in black, and you know, as a maker, I get a lot of ink and stuff on my hands, and I like that. I can only imagine if Dina used it, it would be very colorful with paint. But that's what we're going to focus on today, right? Move this out of the way. <laughs> and I'll talk about what we're going to do, right, with this shaping kit. So the shaping kit allows you to do many things, and that's what I want to demo throughout uh, the whole day, right? And by the whole day, I mean as long as I talk, right? So first, well, it could be the whole day. So first up, this is, a, this is an older die. This is one of my favorites. This is I don't even know the official name. Maybe this is Tiny Tattered Floral or something like that. It is a thinlet. And these were inspired by the, the large tattered floral, right? That's the size of that big tattered floral, the original one so many years ago that was a steel rule die. But these are much smaller and you can see they're all different sizes of these flowers, right? There's some leaves, there's a little branch. And honestly, the packaging is not very exciting for what it can do. It's just been around forever. Then we have this one, and maybe this is the tinier the mini. Again, I don't know, but I know Sizzix is in the house, so I know they can give you like the right names. But this guy, this is when I was quilling roses and all that, and I'm like, ooh, this die actually came with a quilling tool. And as I mentioned, I don't use this anymore. So I've, I've pitched mine. I just don't use it. I use the squeezers instead, and you'll see why. So I'll talk about this a little bit, but what I want you to keep in mind throughout this demo is that once you learn about shaping, okay, you can shape so many things. So, I, and I wanna just cover that so you're not like, will it work with this? Will it work with this? What about this die? What about that? It could be any die that you have that you wanna give contour. So like if you have any of the funkies, right? Funky floral one, funky floral two, funky floral three, uh, funky foliage, funky festive, large funky, right? Large funky festive. These guys are funky because they have, well, obviously a funky shape, but they have the ability to add all these little layered pieces. That's another great thing, is if you like any of these ideas and you don't have this die, right? You can take any of these dies and create it. The benefit of this is obviously the different sizes that give us the ability to add uh, more depth and dimension, but any of those kind of organic dies are going to work. If you have anything detailed like a little wreath, this also is a way that we can uh, give dimension to any little branch or leaf that's on something that's normally flat. If you have the new funky nature, very cool because we can take something that's flat, like a feather, and look at the shape that you can give that piece of paper, right? So if you're using this as an embellishment, right? Maybe you're doing something mixed media, maybe you're doing whatever, and you want to incorporate this feather, this is just very cool because it is shaped. And it's shaped with purpose, meaning even if I go with my fingers and I, I press down, you're gonna see it goes back to its shape. Now, for those that say, well, what about mailing things like that? If you're ever gonna mail anything that has shape or dimension, do it in a bubble envelope because it's going to get crushed. If you're going to do something that is going to, let's say, go into a shadow box, a lot of times I'll still put a little bit of foam adhesive behind those inner places. This way it's just going to provide a little stability. But the shape itself, 
all that contour and you can see the little ruffles around that feather, that's all done with the shaping tool. And to me, what a difference from just a flat feather to that, okay? Now, if you have like funky toadstools, fun because we can take these guys and actually give them that, that dome shape like a mushroom. Very, very simple. If you have anything small, believe it or not, even if you have little things like wildflowers, you can still go in and add a little shape or a little texture to your leaves, your flower petals, anything like that. So my point being is if you have any dyes, try it, okay? You don't have to have this specific dye to make it work, but this is what I wanted to demo on because it's really a like, very dramatic way to show the benefits of a shaping kit. Like you notice it right away, okay? Now, once we talk about flowers and stuff, I'm, I'm going to get into other things because you can also use the shaping kit for things other than flowers, but I don't want to confuse things too much. We're just going to jump right into the demo, all right? So what we're going to end up achieving from this is creating things that actually have some incredible dimension. I'll hold these up uh, with my glamorous pork chop fingers. So this one, we're going to focus on this die, okay? That's where these flowers are done. Look at those little flowers. Look at the shape of that. Now both of these flowers, now I'll tell you right now, I'm not a gardener. I don't have a green thumb. I do not know my flower. So for those that say it looks like whatever, great. Definitely educate the crowd because I don't know and I don't know what color a flower should be. I just do what I like. But the cool thing about both of these is these are done with exactly the same dye, right? It just depends on how you shape it, right? Do you have the petals curling in to create this kind of flower? Or do you have the petals curling out or curving out to create this kind of flower, right? So, so many options with that one. But depending on how you create and how you change, if you change up your die shape, we can also create something like this. And I love the look of this because again, we're just using paper. And if you're gonna create something for home decor, for a gift accent, for anything, it's a cool way to make your own custom flowers from your backgrounds. And I'm even gonna show you how to create backgrounds, right? And we'll go into this little blue one. Look at that. Right. And I get it. You might say, well, Tim, you know, these don't have stamen, yada, yada. Well, they do in my world. OK. And I'm going to get through what kind of paper I'm going to get through everything. We're going to demo the whole entire thing. So baby steps. I just need to show you what we're doing before we actually start to do it. OK. Then we'll talk about something dimensional like this. This has been great. But um, if any of you that have tried this before, this die had an immediate love-hate relationship with the makers. Some people, uh, because we've used it for roses and pine cones, and some people go, oh, I hate this. It doesn't even look uh, natural or anything like that. But believe it or not, this cool little die that starts out flat, both of those pieces start out flat, turn into these. I mean, take a look at this little rose. This rose is so charming like a little tea rose, but look at the detail. Look at the shape and contour of the petals. It's not sticking up uh, like a cabbage, and, and you could certainly do that, but I love the shape that it gives. Or this guy, like, look at this one, right? How you can have all that shape and curve go into the flowers. We're gonna demo all of this. So you're gonna see, we're gonna talk about paper, we're gonna talk about ink, we're gonna talk about glue, we're gonna talk about everything, but I think it's always important to see where we're going before we head down the road. Right? So those are the two that we're going to talk about, and then I'll get into some other dies. Let's go. And throughout there, I'll just try to watch the chat. I am seeing the chat where you guys are like, what kind of paper, what kind of this, and we'll get there. Okay, so first things first, we need to create some backgrounds, and we're going to talk about paper, okay? It's all good, Mario? We're good. Excellent. Okay, let me bring this up. i got to make some room here. Whoa, this new setup, I like it, but... Oh, there we go. It's like a perfect little fit. Okay. All right. I know. All right. So we're going to talk about that. So when it comes to paper, right, you can use a variety of papers. You can use a variety of cardstocks. We can take watercolor cardstock. Now, this happens to be uh, distress watercolor cardstock. You could do watercolor cardstock. I'm going to talk about weights of paper as well. We can also get into mixed media heavy stock, right? That's the one that... Uh, really has more of a mixed media kind of vibe to it. Now, when it comes to these shaping specifically, I do not like to use the new heavy stock in craft and white. That 130 pound is just too heavy for what I'm doing. 
So things like, if you're like, ooh, could I do this at a chipboard or a grunge board or grunge paper? I don't recommend that. Here's, here's the whole breakdown. Cardstock, most cardstock, including the one that I did in Ideology, this is an 80 pound cardstock. So this is the Ideology craft stock. An 80 pound is good. This is pretty much a standard and you can create some, some great things with an 80 pound. But I will tell you what I've learned about shaping when it comes to paper is that 80 pound can get overworked, right? If you do too much to an 80 pound, you could actually uh, tear through it or poke through it. So I prefer like minimum of a hundred pound weight and your paper is going to tell you. So like the watercolor, uh, this is 118 pound mixed media, just the regular mixed media, that's 110 pound, right? So 110 pound is going to be lighter than this one. So both of these will work because it's in like the, you know, 100, 118 range. I wouldn't go any, any heavier than 118 or it's going to be challenging to sculpt and you'll see why in the demo. So going back to this 80 pound, um, there's a lot of things that I love about this paper, but there's some things that um, I don't love about this paper. And so just to kind of give you a little teaser, we are actually uh, retiring this line and we have a new line of paper coming out uh, this month with Ideology. So just stay tuned and you're going to see that it fits perfect with that little, little teaser for, for watching this, right? You'll know what's coming up later this month. Okay. So let's talk specifically about backgrounds for the sake of this demo and to avoid confusion, I'm going to work completely with watercolor paper, right? So now that I've kind of given you the breakdown, will it work on this? Will it work on vellum? Will it work on, you can try all of those papers. You can try whatever you have. Will it work on index? Will it work on printed paper? Try it on whatever you want. Just keep in mind that the thinner the paper, the gentler you have to be because it's not going to be as resilient as this 118 that I'm going to work on. Okay. So anything that you want to work, I always tell people, try it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our cardstock, our watercolor paper, and I like to cut it. And because I'm going to be cutting flowers using my sidekick, okay, because these flowers will fit in the sidekick, I just go ahead and pre-cut it to what fits on that cutting pad. This way I'm able to use all the real estate. That's just what I do. And believe it or not, it's just taking an eight and a half by 11, you quarter cut it. So you end up getting four of these. Then you take it this way and you do a two and a half cut and a two and a half cut and I get rid of that little strip. I'm, I'm done. So it's really like two and a half, right? By four and a quarter. That's just what I like to do. And you can always tell on your media mat, if you go in the corner, it's an easy way that you can line it up and measure it four and a quarter, two and a half like that. Okay. So I go in and pre-cut all of my watercolor paper to that size. Could you do a background on a bigger piece? You do whatever you want. You do you, I do me. But the reason I like to do that is because then I have all these backgrounds ready to go. Right? So when I want to work with it, I have all the look and feel. And the reason I also like to cut them to size is because you know when you do ink backgrounds, the ink likes to do really cool stuff along the edges. And so I feel if I start with a, a whole piece and then chop it in half, you kind of lose some of that pooling that you would get. Again, that's just a preference. And I'm going to talk about how we do these. Now when I make flowers, I like to ink both sides. Both sides because I think by doing both sides, we get to have a little bit more flexibility as to how we want to shape it. Meaning if the petal is, is curving over, we don't have to worry about revealing a white side, right? Or a craft side. So that's why I like to just do both sides of the paper. And we can do some other blends. So first things first, we're going to talk about these guys, right? These, these are the four new colors. So these are the three that we did last year and the new Kitsch Flamingo. And I'm going to talk about how we can create these and do other blends with them, right? And I won't do tons of inking, but I'll do a couple of times just so you really get the hang of it, all right? So when it comes to creating blends, like let's start with this one, okay? This is using the new Kitsch Flamingo. Now, could you just do one color? Absolutely, you could stick with one color. In fact, if you watch the demo, you see that you get a beautiful background. But one of the great things about Distress is mixing colors because you get a lot more depth. So this one is Kitsch Flamingo and Tattered Rose. Now, when I do this technique, like when I do a lot of these background papers, I prefer to work with my minis. And the reason I do that is because I can get a lesser amount of ink so I can get more of a variety because as much as I love these guys, if I was working on bigger backgrounds, well, hey, the regulation size is it, you know, art journals, cards, I would smash the big ink pad. But because I'm doing small pieces of paper at a time, I want a little bit more variety. So that's why I choose that. Now, these guys, these will be, these new colors will be released in minis later this month. So those that have been holding out for the minis in Distress Ink, 
Uh, they'll be out later this month. But for now, because this is the only size I have, I'm just gonna start by smashing it on the non-stick mat of my media mat. It's really important that you work on the non-stick mat and not directly on the glass because we want the ink to bead up. When I'm doing this, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that I want to press down on the ink pad. So I'm not just dragging it like that. It doesn't do anything. You need to press down to get some ink out of the pad. Big or small, doesn't matter. So here you can see I need to do quite a bit because I have such a big uh, area of kitsch, but that's all right. Could you do as many colors? Absolutely, you can go crazy. Do as many colors as you want. But for now, I'm just gonna stick with those two colors. Watercolor cardstock, spray bottle with water, and a heat tool for drying. Okay, we're gonna see if the microphone likes a heat tool. We'll know in just a minute. All right, so I'm just going to spray this. Just gonna give it a couple of sprays just to create droplets. I don't wanna hose this down, but you can see right away that that ink intensified because that is the benefit of Distress Ink. It is, when we say reactive with water, it doesn't just mean that it'll blend with water. That's obvious with any water-based ink. Reactive means it's going to become more intense and it's gonna have great wicking properties. So I'm just going to take this paper. It doesn't matter which side you start with because we're going to do both sides eventually, but I work one, at a, one side at a time. So I'm just gonna start by pressing down, I'm gonna flip that over, and I'm going to dry it. And the reason I wanna do that is if you take a look, this one is just gonna give me kind of a blend. Not much, and don't worry about, oh, I missed a spot of paper, I missed this. If you wanna create the look of layered ink, you have to layer it. You're welcome. But it's really important that the only way to achieve that look is to do the work, all right? So I'm just going in, drying it. Doesn't have to be crispy dry. You can see there's still a little bit of uh, wet ink on the ends of it, that's fine. But now I'm going to go in and instead of pressing like my first layer, I'm going to take advantage of the ink that's on this mat, these droplets. And that's why this mat is so important because ink doesn't behave this way on glass. You don't get little droplets, you get puddles instead. So now I'm just gonna go in, just tap that around. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. You're just gonna go in and dry that layer. Even if you missed a spot, even if you don't have as many drips that you have, this will take really probably about five layers or so. So this is one of the things that you sit down one day, one night, whatever, when you don't have any creative juju going on and you just work. You just ink and then you have no thinking at all. You don't have to overthink the ink. You're just going to go in and create layers. So this again, splashing, drying. And by drying what's happening, and I'll show you in just a minute after I dry this layer, is we're going in and we are showing kind of the outline of color. Okay. Excellent. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so watch, watch when I hold it up in just a second. Drying is really important, believe it or not. That's why I love a craft tool. Uh, unlike an embossing gun, it doesn't blow the ink everywhere. It's the same temperature of an embossing gun, but it doesn't have that high fan speed. But look at what's happening so far right? By drying those layers, we're getting this wonderful outline, because this is what I mean about wicking. Wicking means that the Distress ink is actually working away from itself. It's wicking away. And once you drip it somewhere and you dry it, the ink is like pushing itself to the out, outside areas, and you get a very, very cool effect. So I'm going to go in again. And as we pick up this ink, you'll see that my droplets are getting smaller. And by getting smaller droplets, well, look what's happening to our background. We're getting those little droplets. So you just, you go for it. Okay. So a lot of times I'll just sit down and play because the nice thing about these blends, you are introduced to color combos that, well, maybe you didn't do. Or sometimes I'll even challenge myself. I'm like, all right, Holtz, you're going to take colors that you have not touched in a year. And that those are going to be your blended backgrounds. And honestly, you create some magic, right? I'll show you some that I did where I was using like shaded lilac and milled lavender. Like shut the front door. What is that? I haven't touched those colors, I don't know, maybe since Distress came out, but I use that. All right, so once you're happy with it, right, just step away from the ink. Let's say you wanted a little bit of something else, right? Let's say you were saying, oh, okay, I really want more tattered rose. If you don't have it on your mat, add it to your mat. There's nothing wrong with going in and adding a color, but make sure you spray it with water again and continue. My suggestion is try to avoid that because that's going to get you in this vicious circle of trying to make a masterpiece from a background. A background is called a background because it's in the background. It's one of those things that you're not going to see perfectly when your work is done, right? So next I'm going to go in and add more ink. Now because I'm using the same colors, I'm not going to wipe this off. Could you? Absolutely. You could go in with whatever you want, a paper towel, 
uh, a cloth, anything, and you can wipe that up. But I know where I put the color because I can see it. So I'm just going back in a little bit of water on a water-based pad, not a problem. It's just gonna hydrate a little bit more. And you'll notice that I put the color in different areas. The reason I do that is because I'll have a better chance of catching that blend than if I just did like this color, this color, this color, right? So you'll see when you use more minis, I just kind of do more of a patchwork because it's much more random. So let's take a look at this one because now I'm going to flip it over to this side of the watercolor. The cool thing about Distress watercolor cardstock is it's got a textured side and it's got a smooth side. And both of those sides are watercolor, but both of those react totally different. So there's my water. Watch what happens when we do this one. So we're gonna start with our little print. We're gonna flip it over. So even if I have this, even if I have that, I'm going to dry it. Now let's say you don't like these little speckly bits, okay? No problem. If you just hit it with a little water, those little speckly bits will wick and they'll start to soften up. I don't overthink that, I just go for it. All right, just gonna dry. Bring these minis to Europe. They are worldwide, so you don't have to worry. But I think maybe that was to someone. All right, good deal. Speckly bits are awesome, I agree. Okay, so here's our first layer. Now what you're gonna notice on the back of watercolor cardstock, the smoothie side, is that your inks have a smoothie effect. You can see that it's definitely more of a softer blend than what you get here because on the textured side, the ink is sitting in those textured elements and on the smoothie side, we're getting definitely more of a wash. But they will both layer, right? So you'll see there's the textured side and there's the smoothie side. So see, they both do what they do, but the textured side just has a little bit more, I don't know, grit to it. But I can't say that I have a favorite. You know, sometimes I'll just look and I'm like, oh, okay. I need to, I need to definitely use it. All right, we're gonna go into this big old ink pile and we're gonna tap there and we're gonna dry. So look at that. Got a nice big pop of color right there because we went right into that puddle of kitsch. Kitsch Flamingo, for those of you that have it, such a nice pink, isn't it? So, so nice. All right, how do you keep watercolor paper from warping? Well, you don't worry about it first off, right? I'm gonna die cut these anyway, so I don't care, but let's say you do care. Let's say you were doing um, a background and you wanted it to be flat for a card, I like to take my cardstock and I'll run it through my mink, right? I'll just put the cardstock in between that carrier sheet and run it through the mink uh, on either the low or high setting, depending on the kind of paper I'm using, and it will flatten out perfect. So instead of ironing it, if you have a mink or a laminator, you can just use that and it will flatten your paper. All right, so I'm just gonna go in. Now I like the little speckles because I want those drips. See, look at that, ooh, nice. And I embrace the space, okay? Here we go. Just gonna dry that. I completely agree, the Ranger heat tool is the best. What is the difference with hot press paper? Hot press paper is completely smooth on both sides. Cold press, bumpy, both sides. So distress is like hot on one, cold on the other kind of thing. So hot press paper is always smooth so you don't get the texture that you would from a cold press. And so some people like a cold press because obviously the texture is what allows that ink to kind of puddle up, but the smooth, see everything's, this kind of reminds me of like bubbles, you know, when you get that ink bubbles to smooth out. So no right or wrong, we're gonna do both. So uh, okay. <clears throat> Janet was asking, can you iron it if you don't have a mink? Of course you can. Yeah, anything hot and flat, but ironing, then you have to do the pressure, <laughs> right? If you have a laminator, it's heat and pressure and so, that's just kind of a good hack. But yeah, absolutely. I used to iron paper. That's how I started with Distress. It is. Ironing paper, yeah. So now let's compare both of these. Both of these are done with exactly the same combo, but a different ratio, right? So if you know that you wanna do a background that's a little bit softer, well then use less of the vibrant color, okay? So you get to control the, the ratio that you want of a background. So let's just take something like speckled egg, right? Speckled egg is a good one. I love doing a little speckled egg background. Look at these guys, mm, so good, right? It's a very light color. So I've just wiped this off. It just wipes clean. I just use a cloth. I prefer to work with a flour sack towel instead of paper towels. It's just a preference. So I'm just gonna go in and smash it. Now we'll go into the minis. Let's take some colors that I wanna work with. So here, maybe I wanna add, I don't know, maybe I wanna add a little bit of turquoise. So I'll take some broken china, just a little smash there. Not too much. I don't wanna, I wanna overpower 
any of that. Then we'll take, oh, let's go into this guy. Okay, I love these because you just have so much flexibility of a little bit of color. There's some stormy sky. Excellent. And then, hmm, let's go. I think I'm going to just leave that because I'm going to, I'll go in and add a little grunge. You know what? I'm not going to leave it because I don't want to. <laughs> Here, I'm just going to go in. Let's throw in a little bit of crushed olive. That'll be interesting. A little bit of green, right? So see how I threw it in different areas because we're going to catch it. We don't know what's going to happen. So how do you keep your mat from curling on the ends? Um, I talk about this every time I use the media mat. When you clean it off, you start on the mat and, st and end on the mat. If you are in the habit of wiping from your glass to the mat, you are pushing all that garbage, ink, muck, underneath this silicone mat, and that's what's going to get it to curl. So when I clean it, I start on the mat, wipe, wipe, end off the mat. I never go across the entire thing. If my glass mat gets that mucky, I'll remove this, clean the whole thing with glass cleaner, sanitizer, whatever, and then put this flat. You know, eventually it's going to get uh, trash. That's why we sell replacements of these, you know, uh, after, a while of use, it's inevitable that you're going to need to replace it, but that's really what I do. So does Kitsch have an embossing glaze? It absolutely does. So we're going to go in, just going to do my first print. There we go. So not much, not much at all, really. This isn't super exciting to me, but I'm going with it, right? You need to. That crushed olive is a little powering, but that's going to be okay. Speckled egg and Kitsch is very gorgeous. I agree, Marty. It's like cotton candy. It's really nice. So this is what I'm trying to remind you of. When you're doing these backgrounds, you really need to just get out of your head, right? You need to, I mean, I always say, get over yourself, right? That's important because otherwise, you're just going to constantly be second guessing everything you do as if it's not correct. And it is correct because it's just a background. All right. I'm just gonna dry this. So right now, and I'll hold this up just so you can see, our backgrounds are definitely on the, the wet side, okay? So let's say you're doing backgrounds and you can't get color to move there, right? If you've ever done watercolor, you know that pretty much once you create like a water barrier, your color wants to always go to that barrier and stop. If you wanna make sure that your backgrounds have flow from, from end to end, I'll, I'll show you on the next one how we can achieve that, okay? But this, I don't mind the space, you know, embrace the space, but you might want to, you might not like that. So in order to get the splatters, you can see I'm splashing in puddles. I'm not pressing. If you press, you're never going to get these little spots. They're always going to flatten out. All right. Yeah, it is the best thing to tell yourself and not in a harassing way, in a really important reminder way. If you can get over yourself, it's very, very freeing when it comes to creating. Okay. So again, splash. See, look at all these little dots. Look at that magic just from splashing in the puddles. So I, I know a lot of times when people do backgrounds, they always have that habit of cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. No way. Every little bit is good. But if you see something that you don't like, remove it. You know, if it looks like sludge, it is sludge, but you might like that sludge. I, I don't know if it's even on camera, but there's a little spot over here of little sludge magic that I'm about to go in right now. There we go. Yeah, right down there. Okay, so this is good. I'm happy with this layer. I'll show you on the other side how we can create more of a blended background from Go. All right, perfect. And see, these are gonna be good. Like if this was a background for a card, mm, I'm not sure if I would dig the crushed olive, but because I'm gonna be cutting these apart, I totally dig crushed olive. Okay, now because I've got stuff everywhere at this point, right? Before, remember with the last background, it was pink and pink, but this is blue and green and all that. I don't wanna risk getting green in my blue. So I'm going to clean it off. So here's my towel. I call it the Inky Binky. It's a flour sack towel. Uh, you want something that doesn't have lint, but watch. I'm going to start on the mat. Up, stay on the mat, stay on the mat, dismount off the mat. That's it. Never go from the glass. So simple to do that. And then that will stay flat. Okay, we're going to go back to our inks. Now, could you use sprays if you don't have ink pads? Absolutely. You could take your sprays and spray it on here. You would do the same exact thing. Here, we're going to take a little bit of... Stormy Sky, a little bit more of that. And for this one, instead of Crushed Olive, I'm gonna go in with Bundled Sage. It's gonna be a little bit more on the gray green side than that yellow. So both sides don't have to be the same. Okay, we're gonna spray that. Again, I'm just spraying it until I see droplets, right? Little tiny droplets. We don't want big, giant, 
uh, rain droplets. We just want tiny droplets. Now, in order to get this to be more blended, I'm, go I'm going to spray the back of the paper with water, or it could be the front, whatever side you're working on, I should say. Just mist it with a little water, and now when it comes in contact with this ink, it's going to want to go from end to end. You see that? Because now it doesn't have any dry barriers. Make sense, right? Or that had all those dry barriers, which I happen to like. But if you're gonna do a background, let's say you were just going to do a sky, and you wanted to go in and do that, you could totally take that whole background just by misting it with water. And if you wanna move it, Right, you can spray a little bit more water. You can see that it's coming in right there, really subtle colors. Very nice. So that's how we can create simple, simple background blends. If you want something very faded and very muted, then start with slightly damp paper. If you want something splotchy and layered, start with dry paper. No right or wrong. But this, this is really, really good. Someone asked about adding new things to the app. The Tim Holtz app will soon be deleted permanently. We are working on a whole new web-based platform uh, that doesn't require a smartphone, although you can use a smartphone with it because it will be web-based the same way you would you know, go on Google or whatever. Um, but then the app itself will be gone. We've had so many issues through the years. It doesn't even, we have an Android platform for years, but that's why we haven't updated it at all last year because uh, later this year, we are launching an entire web-based platform, which is going to be so much better for you guys because then you don't have to worry about the cloud and losing it and all that, and you will have access uh, on your smartphone as well as uh, your computer, your iPad, whatever device you're on. So that will be later on in the year, but yeah, that's what we're doing. Nice. Look at this one. See, a whole different vibe than before, but very nice. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, again, drying, drying. Now here, I want, you can see that background. I wanna add a little bit more of that green. So you can see right here, see on the mat, I've got some of that bundled sage. I know that it doesn't have a lot of droplets, so that means it's gonna print really dark. So I just gave it a little spray of water. It can go in there. There we go. See, look at that. That's really nice. That just gave me the ability to just put a little bit on there. If I wouldn't have sprayed that with water, it would have printed pretty much like it appears on your mat. So always pay attention to that as well. Uh, no, we will not be, sorry, we will not be transferring from the app. So it's going to be a whole do-over, but hey, think of it as a whole get acquainted thing again. You'll be able to get acquainted with all the stuff that maybe you forgot you had, or you'll be able to uh, pass on the stuff that you don't use anymore. So, all right. How do I name my colors? I don't know. I just, I look at them and whatever the color is, and I always wanted to have some sort of I want, the, I want the name to make you feel the color. That's, so I really don't know. And I'll brainstorm, you know, sometimes I'll uh, talk to people at Ranger or Paula or Mario, or I mean, it, it just really depends. So, but I always have something in mind of what I want to call it. And sometimes things totally change. You know, this, this color was going to be, I think it was some sort of botanical or something before, and then it ended up being a rustic wilderness. So you never really know. All right, there's another background. So as you get it, we could go, on and on and on with backgrounds, which is what I've done here, okay? So you wanna create a pile of backgrounds. And once you do that, you're, we're gonna be ready to do some flowers, which is gonna be next. But I wanted to mention one other thing when it came to backgrounds, okay? And that is like this ability to blend. And for this, I'm going to speak specifically about kitsch, okay? And this doesn't necessarily have to be about kitsch, it could be any color. But my point being is sometimes you will get a new color or you'll have a color maybe that you don't use, right? And you think, I don't really know about this. And it happens all the time, because when we announce a new color, they're like, oh, I really want like a Merlot wine color, or I really want a brighter purple, or I really want, there's always requests because there's a bazillion colors that we could have, and I love that you guys want more colors in distress, as do I. But I also don't want you to forget the importance of taking a color and mixing it with a color you already have to create a new color. So for example, if we wanted to take aged mahogany, which is normally really dark, I mean, it's mahogany, but we want to give it a little bit of a vibrant color, mixing aged mahogany with kitsch flamingo. Look at that background. That is amazing. It is like a beautiful kind of, I don't know, wine color because that pop of kitsch underneath, and if you don't have kitsch, maybe you want to try worn lipstick, or you want to try picked raspberry, or whatever it is, that's just taking two colors and doing exactly what I did before, right? 
If you're going into the purple, this is taking Dusty Concord and Kitsch, but look at that. I'm getting so many different colors of purple because it's giving that highlight of pink. So for people that wanted a little bit of a brighter purple, you can take Kitsch and throw it in there, or you can even mix purples, which um, that's what I did on this guy, right? So this one, this doesn't have any Kitsch, but this is the one I was saying is um, shaded lilac and milled lavender. These things right here, that would be my fingers because they do get inky and sometimes when I'm pressing down, I'll get ink and I just call that a bonus, but that's where that came from, not the mat. But see, two colors I rarely use, but I love uh, that mix of what, what happened, okay? Or you can take something that's a little bit unpredictable. Maybe we are going to do like a rose garden and we want a little bit of green thrown in with that pink, right? You wouldn't think of taking these because green and pink make mud. They absolutely do. But if you don't overwork it, right? If you print, dry, print, dry, print, dry, you're not mixing the colors, you're layering the colors. And it just becomes something really stunning. So don't ever, don't ever worry about mixing your colors, right? Because a certain color that may not be your favorite could actually be that magic elixir into what you're doing for backgrounds. You know, case in point in the alcohol ink world, right? Mushroom became this magical thing because of how it, how it works. So just when you get a color or if you don't get a new color, play around with mixing because I think you're really going to surprise yourself on the versatility of what you already have. Okay. So that's ink backgrounds. I could keep going for days and days. And can you do it on different paper? Yes, I mentioned when uh, Kit Flamingo came out to play around with different papers. This is mixed media. This is the same exact blend that I did here, Tattered Rose and Kitsch Flamingo. But you can see that because of changing the paper, the Kitsch, I mean, even if I compare it to one that's like heavily Kitsch, you can see that Kitsch Flamingo on that mixed media, like just that color of paper, that kind of yellowy, just makes that pink go just wonderful. <laughs> so you can certainly change uh, the paper, but for the sake of this, we're gonna keep on with watercolor, okay. So next up, once you have your backgrounds, now it's time to cut out some flowers. We're gonna take these guys, and I'll just show you how simple it is to cut out flowers, kind of give you some tips. Uh, you can use whatever machine you wanna work with. Okay? I'm just going to work with the Sidekick because it's here, and these are small, and as long as the die is no larger than this, it's going to work. So I'm just gonna place this down. It's got that little lever, okay? Now the suction cup is not supposed to be indefinite. It's not like you can do Mission Impossible and like, you know, steal a diamond with it. But it's, if you are going to work with it a while and you wanna make sure that your machine stays put, <clears throat> maybe you're gonna do a lot of Christmas cards or whatever, uh, just give your glass media mat a little spray of water and then put this down. And this is really going to make it, I mean, grab onto it. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so next we're going to take our papers I'm going to lay this down on either one of the mats. I'll take the flowers, we're gonna place it down, and I just place them at random. That's kind of the benefit of doing a background is that you can use every little bit of this. So let me just kind of give you some, well, I don't think I want that one. I think I want this little guy, I'm just making sure. Because the difference in these petals, here, let me, let me hold it up. It's a good opportunity uh, for the demo. These flowers are actually a little different. Some have a longer petal and some have a stubbier petal. So depending on your flower, you can certainly mix and match. I think for the purposes of this, just to keep things a little bit, there we go. I'm gonna do all of the same kind of flower. This is the one that has a longer petal. So what I was saying is, let's say you wanted to get every bit of your paper and I start my dies on an end. And I'm just, I'm talking to sidekick owners, okay? You never want to take your dies and put them at the end of your cutting pad to go through your machine. It's not gonna to want to do that. So even though I wanna save my paper, all I need to do is just slide my paper back, right? Duh, I don't, I don't need to cut the paper. I just need to slide it back so the dies are not right up against that lip, right? Then we can just go in, take that, make our sandwich over the top, put it in. And when you, when you put that in, the handle's gonna kinda of tell you which way to go. And we're just gonna run that through. But see, it'll take that sandwich because it starts out flat. If you have too much at the, at the beginning, the machine's not gonna wanna go through. And you may have already experienced that before where you put your dies and you try to run it through and like it's just not taking it. It's because if you've got dies right up against the edge of that cutting pad, no way, it doesn't wanna do that, okay? So what I'm gonna do, let me find where I put it. I'll take this out. Oh, there it is, buried under my backgrounds. 
just going to take my die pick, have the back on it, and I'm just going to use the die pick just to push these out. Okay, pretty simple. The die pick can sometimes take out the paper or it can just push. And so when I use the die pick, you'll see that I use kind of the side of it and I push out versus piercing through it. It's totally up to you though. These little tiny holes are for poke holes, so you can take all those little holes in the back of a die or poke holes to fit the die pick. We're just going to go in and just take that. And sometimes, you know, they're just really kind of jammed up in there. There we go. So we've got some nice, great little tattered flowers. See, inked on both sides. Wonderful. And now we can do the same thing with the rest of that paper. So this will allow us to have a couple of flowers. And I like the fact that I can look down and see what I want to cut from where. So see that one little bit is going to give me two sets of that. Okay, but same thing, I'm gonna place it down to where it's not at the end of my cutting pad. I'm gonna place this over the top of it. Okay, and we go in. Off we go. Perfect, perfect. Oh, see, Karen says she wishes that I had ejection foam. I actually hated that. Um, I remember like the, the quick cuts days when they had that foam, I always felt that like that didn't, nothing against quick cuts, but I just, I never really liked it. I didn't. So let's talk about this little flower because I see that it, it overlapped a previous cut area. Bonus, that's like a little bug chew right there. So that's gonna work for me. But yeah, the ejection foam, that always used to, I like the fact that I don't have to dig it out of the thing because if it had foam, your motion would always be digging. I just like that I can blast it from the back, but everyone has preference. There's no right or wrong. We're all entitled all entitled to do what we want and create how we want. Okay, so once we have some flowers, we can just keep going on and on. If we wanted to take and cut out leaves, it's the same thing. Take some green, place your leaf dies. I mean, you guys get the, you get the gist of this, okay? But I'm gonna cut out just a few more just so I have them, because I'm here. And same thing, I'm gonna, I actually wanna use all that space. Okay, so you can see that I had a little white area. Well, I didn't put a leaf there because if I do, that leaf is not gonna have any color on it. I'm just gonna move that back a little bit. Make sure to move my dies. Perfect. And the only thing I wanna make sure, I don't really do a lot of taping if it comes with a sidekick, but if you're one of those that are kind of concerned with you know, how something is going to, to cut, you can always tape it. Some people do tape, but I found that you know even something like a washi tape is going to sometimes be a little challenging. I'm just gonna pierce all these out. There we go. Okay, put these back and off we go. And some people like to use the negatives of their dies, go for it. If you have a beautiful negative that you wanna use, then use it. I find that it's served its purpose for me and you know, unless it's a silhouette of a butterfly or something, I don't bother with it. Okay. So this still going to go in my stack because, well, it, there's still a lot of paper there. Yes, I would keep this in, in color order. Otherwise, it would drive me a little nutty, right? Because then I can just keep all that. I love this blend. Look at this. That's crackling campfire, fossilized amber, and a little hickory smoke. Ooh, that's a good one, isn't it? See, look at that little bit of gray. Ooh. Okay. So before we get into shaping, I'll talk about one other thing, and that is... What if, what if I just sit and watch TV and I cut out a bunch of things just out of white watercolor paper? What if I didn't have anything inked? Can you do that? Of course you can, right? So there's times that maybe I have like a larger die. So let's just talk about these. These are the new brush stroke flowers uh, from chapter one. These are much, much bigger. And you'll notice on these that it have all the pieces of that flower on one die. Well, gosh, if you were doing it out of colored paper, you've got to cut it a lot of times to get all those pieces in different colors. And sometimes it drives people just crazy with that. I don't mind it because every time I cut it out of a different color, I can make that color flower. But if you don't want to, you can just take your watercolor paper and then cut out the dye, right? So that one dye, like for that flower, you can see when you cut it out, there's all the pieces and you can just put them in a bag or whatever. This way, you have all your pieces for your flower and you get, to decide how you want to color it, right? So let's just talk about that real quick. If I'm going to color the flower, we'll just take this, this one right here. So here you can see that I've got my pieces. And a lot of times you can follow the artwork, right? So you can see I've got pink 
different shade, but that's only from inking. So I would have my layered pieces because everything is cut out of watercolor, right? And again, you can do either side, whatever you want to do. So I've got all my pieces. And this is helpful also for colorize. For those of you that are doing a lot of colorize and you're like, man, this is like, I'm going through so many colors of cardstock and it's driving me just bonkers. Don't worry about it. You can start with white and add color. So how do we add color? Well, we have some different ways that we can do it. One, we can take a blending tool, right? You can take a blending tool and you can ink these. Uh, you can do the same thing I did here. We can spray, uh, put the ink down, spray it, and like actually print your pieces. Or we can go in and color them. So here I'm just going to grab the top of this. I'm going to peel off the mat, right? When I do that, I just kind of leave it just that side up. And now I'm going to work on the palette. And this was really designed for any of those ink cubes that you have. So we can go in and take our ink cube and you can just press it down. I love the fact that it has that white glass behind it because it's just going to allow me to see the colors that I create. And you'll, you'll also notice that when I'm doing this, I am, again, pressing down, giving it a little twist because you want some of that ink to really go down there. I don't need to make a full palette. I'm just going in uh, with colors that I want to use. So we'll take a little bit of fossilized amber. And so this is nice because sometimes I'll have a bunch of flowers cut, I'll make a full palette, and then I'll just spend the time coloring. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, I talk a lot about just doing kind of taking your creative ideas and just kind of, I don't know, compartmentalizing the thought process because sometimes if you sit down and you have to do everything from start to finish, you really lose, I don't know, the fun of it is all I would say. You lose the fun of it. I think you know what I'm talking about, that if you've ever had to sit down and you're like, I need to make a card and you have to start by cutting and doing this and doing this, by the time you're done, you're like, I'll never make that again. But if these things are all done, man, making anything is really quick. So what we can do is we can watercolor these. So what I'll do is I'll look and I'll say, okay, these are the pieces that I want to have pink. So I'll separate those because some of them, you don't even know what they are. They look like blobs. And then this is going to be the center. And what I will color with, water brushes. Can you use paint brushes? Absolutely. I love the Distress water brushes because I can fill it with water and I can go without worrying about dipping my brush and getting too much water. Now, the Distress water brushes is a detailer. You can see that one. It has a nice detail tip. But for big things like this, I love working with the flat one, right? The flat one's really nice because it will allow me to just go in and do a nice uh, straight brush mark. Or if I'm going to do something like this where I just want my color to be, I don't know, a little bit more organic, I guess, if you will, where it just doesn't look the same. The great thing about the flat is you can grab this ferrule, this little piece right here, and you can pop it off. There we go. And now I have this long round, if you will. So see, that's just flattening the bristles. So if I take that off, it's just going to give me a little bit more play. You'll see what I mean. I'm just going to pick up some of that color and look what I can do. I, I'm definitely more fluid in my movement, right? So instead of just going flat, which I think most of us would have a tendency to go, having that round is almost mopping on the color. So I just like it. Sometimes I'll use the flat. I'll do the flat if I'm gonna do kind of a sky or whatever. Now to clean the brush, it is a water brush, but I can place some water right there on the glass mat and just kind of brush through it because I don't like to squeeze my, I know a lot of people squeeze their water brush. Um, I don't do that to clean it. And then I'll just wring out some of that water just with my fingers. This way I can go in and pick up some more color and just kind of mop it around. Now, another thing about watercolor, and I'll show you that in just a second, is once you get some color down and you think, oh, I wanna layer it. Well, layering with watercolor is not much different than layering how we've done before, which is, I need to dry these, right? In order to get the look of layered, now this wasn't layered, this was just blended. You can see that nice uh, shading of color. But in order to get more of a layer, a little bit more intensity, and um, I just can't help it. I need to just throw on a little bit of kitsch. So I'll do that anyway. I'm just gonna, I can't wait for the kitsch mini myself. All right, now I'm just gonna pop that on. But you can see that by doing that, I was able to just add that nice layer. You can see I'm just really, I know that there's people that probably know how to watercolor that are cringing right now watching me, but that's all right. Like I said, you just do you. Okay, so for the little pieces, same thing, I'm just going to say, okay, well, I want this to be yellow, so I'll just pick up some of that yellow. If I want a little bit of green, I'll throw in some crushed olive there. 
and then I'll go to brown and just right over the top of that, right? Pretty simple, simple way that we can watercolor. And there again, you could just sit there and kind of do, uh, do whatever works for you just using the brush. And then when I'm done with the brush, I'll normally just spray it just to make sure it's clean. These are synthetic bristles, so they may stain a little bit, but it doesn't change anything about it. Then I wanna wring it out and just kind of squeeze. You can see how I got it back to its little flat position. And then we'll take that and we're gonna thread that right through the ferrule, making sure all the bristles are inside. And then you just snap it back on. It doesn't have like a locking sound. It just pushes there. It's like a friction fit. And now we have that. So just a, another way that we can create a, a nicer wash. We can still do inking and all of that to the flowers, all right? So once I'm done, I would just continue to paint. Obviously, if I'm gonna set up a palette, I plan on uh, doing a lot of flowers, but you wanna make sure that you clean this off with water and a dry cloth. We don't wanna leave any ink on that glass before we put our mat back down. Otherwise, you have to clean this. And you can, you can throw this, uh, you can put this in the dishwasher if you want to, this mat. So you can, if you get anything where it no longer wants to uh, stick to the mat, just try washing it. Dish soap's really good, soap and water. Get rid of those air bubbles, just kind of push them out if you can. All right, so that's the other side of doing watercolor. You can do your backgrounds first, or you can just do your die cutting and then do that. But look at that, just how nice is that? Because really, if I had to think about this, it, I would have just taken way too long. But by having the color and just having that big, just call it like the bouncy brush, it's just a little different. And that's a nice way to do these uh, large brush stroke flowers. Okay, so I'm gonna move this off. I'll get back to it, but I do like to keep little pieces in a, you could do it in a bag. You'll see that some pieces are in a portion cup. Just depends on how you wanna stay organized. Okay, and you know, there again, I'm talking about this mat. Some people just, they're like, why did you do the media mat like black? Why is it black? Because to me, it's easier on the eyes. When I'm working on something, I can see it. And I like this white area when I wanna see color. But if I'm working, I just really, that's just me. Everyone has their own personal preference. That's okay. Right, Mario? It's okay. On to shaping. Here we go. Okay, I'm just gonna, distress is just gonna always clean off with a little water. Okay, here we go. So what I'm going to do is you can take your cloth if you wanna take a cloth, or you can take some paper towels. And I'll tell you why in just a, a second because I don't wanna work in a puddle. But I want an area that is gonna be sprayable. Let's just put it right over here. That's gonna work, okay? And I'm going to start with this set first. We'll get to these big ones, maybe, maybe not, just depends. So now I'm gonna start with this sculpting mat. And the idea behind this is it's that foam that's going to allow us to really sculpt and shape things as we work. Now I'm going to try something. So, oh my gosh, deep breath. I'm gonna to try to zoom in so you guys can see it. We'll see how this works before, um, there you go. I'm just gonna zoom in, no. See, I told you Mario, it's gonna freak me out. Okay, I'm just gonna try. Oh, there we go. Wizardry. Yeah, my wizardry, but it scares me. Okay, is that good? Is that, okay, hopefully that's gonna be helpful just to, to try to zoom in. So the whole idea behind shaping flowers is you as the maker still need to decide ultimately what sort of shape you're going for, right? So for example, on these flowers, which flower are you working towards? Now, if you have both sides colored, it's not that big of a deal, but I always tend to have like a favorite, a preference as to what, which one I like. So what you wanna do for me, now again, I'm demoing this with personal preference. There's other videos out there and people have their own way of doing it. I'm showing you the way I like to do it. It doesn't make it the right way, it just makes it the way I do it. I always like to mist the paper on the opposite side of what I'm sculpting because I feel that the tools just kind of go over dry paper better than wet. But I do mist it with water every time because I feel just like when we do 3D folders, it allows the fibers of the paper to soften and then when they soften and it dries again, they stay rigid, right? They're not just gonna flop back down. So let's work on this flower. Let's do them where the petals are like these innies. So that means I want this side visible. So I'm going to mist the back. Now, if you miss the, the wrong side, it's not a big deal. But what I'm gonna do is take my flowers and say, okay, I'm gonna do those layers. I'm gonna do this to all of them. So I'm gonna flip all of those over. There we go, that's gonna work. And for this one, I mean, really, you can do as many pieces as you want, right? You can take, so I'll just do all four. 
turn those over. I don't know if you can see it. I'll move it in camera because I've zoomed in. But I just put it here because what I'm going to do is just go in and just give it a little mist. That one flipped over. Not a big deal. You don't need to hose them down. But I know that they're sitting wet side up on this paper towel. So now when I pick it up, I'm just going to go in and turn it over. Now, even though this is Distress Ink, even though it's going in and it is um, water reactive, I found that it doesn't re-wet the ink that it transfers onto the mat. But if it did, you can just wipe it off. Now we're going to go in and we'll talk about the tool. I'm going to refer to this as the small because it has the small tips and the big one. Okay. So first things first, I'm just going to go in and I'll sculpt this. And I'm going to start with the tiniest tip and I'm going to go right into the end of the petal. So now I'm working on the dry side and I'm just stippling really. So you can see that I'm just taking that stylus and pressing right into the foam, right along that edge. And this is what it's doing. You can see right away that it's giving this really great tattered curve to it. So no other motion other than just tapping that. And it just, it goes very, very quick. So once you do that with the smallest one, you're just gonna flip it over. And now I'm gonna go into the large ball and I'm just going to pull that pedal in. So now instead of a, a stippling motion, I'm actually doing a dragging motion. And you can see, see how it's taking those and bringing those up, it's giving it a little bit more shape. Because if you, if you do everything with just in that piercing motion, it's gonna look like a pin cushion. We don't wanna do that. All right, so now I've got this shape. And you could totally leave it like that, but I wanna give this flower even more flexibility. So next I'm going to move to the big one. And you could do either size, it really just depends. Uh, this flower is a little too small for this one, so I'll just go with this guy. And I'm just going to go right into the middle and then watch, watch the flower. I'm gonna go in a circular motion. There we go. And you see how this turned into like a little cup. So this could be cool if this was gonna be a, a mushroom or something, but this is really nice. And you might think, oh man, this is really just too tight. Well, the nice thing about this is once you build it, you have the ability to relax these. But if you don't start out small, by the time you build it, you can't go back in and, and smush it together again, right? So that's what I do. So I'm just gonna do that to each one. So we'll take the next one, flip it over, start with the small one, pierce and it goes super fast. You might be watching this going, oh my gosh, I don't have time. Are you kidding? This is like, this is just such mindless work because the tools are designed to do the work. So it's the same motion, just dragging that in. And now because the center of this one is smaller, I don't even need to switch tools because I'm going to a smaller one. So I'm going to do the same thing. Circular motion. Ooh, now we made that little cup. Both of these guys, we're just going to flip those over. Hope you guys can see that can't see it, I'll really try. So I'm just pushing that, pushing that down, pushing that down. And again, just going around. It's just, it's serious repetition. This one, and that's why I said like 100 pound is really nice, but same motion. So see how it just makes like a little tiny cup? Ooh, there we go. And this one, the smallest. So this one, I probably will use the small tip for everything even just pulling that around. There we go. And the mat, I mean, the mat's designed to be work. So I think over time, I mean, I've used this for a, a long time, probably, I think I've been playing with this one for about a year, but it, it's, it doesn't seem to disintegrate. And besides, once this side gets a little beat up, you've got a whole nother side that's ready to go. Okay, so now I've got this. I've got these pieces, these little cups. Now, what can you do with it? Well, you have options, right? If you were gonna do this on a card, you don't have to make something like this every time. You could simply die cut your favorite size and you could have 10 of these and put them on a card. You could put a button in there, you can do a brad, and that's all you need to do. You don't always have to nest or stack the flowers. So I want you to keep that in mind that if you're creating something like that, you don't have to always worry about oh, I've got to make you know four layers for each flower. Oh, oh my gosh, no. But by just giving it this shape, just using a single flower now is so much better than just sticking it on flat. Wouldn't you agree? I think so. That's, I certainly think so. So what I want to do next before I build it is I want to give it a little color. But before I do that, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm going to throw those in my cup. I use portion cups a lot. I don't know if you guys do, but it's a great way to like contain <laughs> your creativity. All right. Um, Let's just do it again and I'll talk about the leaves. I won't do all of them, I'll just do a couple of them just to show you. All right, so this is the side I want 
So I'm just going to flip that over. How wet? Um, I don't know. Whatever you want to do, really. We're going to start by just piercing, 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 piercing. And that little tool, believe it or not, because you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, I can just go in with my fingers and bend that. Yes, you can, but it's going to look like you went in with your fingers and bent that. So what this is doing is actually shaping it, it's just giving it that contour. It's rounding it out. You'll see specifically in the leaves. So I do like the fact that, you know, anything in, in creativity, there is always a tool that's designed to make it easier, but it doesn't mean that that tool is the only way to achieve the effect. Am I right? Think about different ways to apply ink, different ways to, to dry ink and emboss and stamping tools. And there's always different ways. You just have to find the way that works. And that's what I really like about this. I've, I've always tried to just do different things by creating shape for the flowers, but man, that's so, so easy. Okay, let's talk about a leaf. Leaf's are very cool, right? Normally it's just flat. So I want this to be the front side. It doesn't really matter, but I want that. So I'm gonna turn that over, face down. Give that a little blast. Who cares if they go flying around? I'll bring both of them up here. And I'll try to keep my hand out of the way because I want you guys to see how that's working. So I always like to start with the tip of this. Even on a leaf, I'm gonna do that same motion, right? Just going around the edge, and I'll hold this up before I, I continue. But what that's doing is that's just taking the edges, and that's really giving it like a tattered look. Do you see that already? It's just giving it enough definition. Then I'll take this one, and I'm just going to, just go in and kind of pull that. Now that's for a leaf that you want to have an up curl. Let's say we want Let's say we want the leaf to flip over it. Well, there's nothing wrong with turning this over. Just because we've already sprayed one doesn't mean we, we can't turn it over and use that side. It's totally fine. But I'll do it on this one just so we can see the difference. Okay? So this one, I'm going to, this is the side I want. So let me just work from the back. I guess it doesn't really matter. And even though this is wet, I don't know if you're going to hear it. Can you hear it get kind of squeaky on the wet side? There you go. You hear that. It just kind of makes the paper a little squeaky, but it doesn't mean you can't use it. So now I'll take the stylus, I'm gonna go in. So now I've created the same kind of curved leaf, right? The one that goes over. But now if I turn this over, that curved one, and I take this tool and I go right at the bottom, and I just make that little divot, it still gave this leaf shape, but now it's got like a little cup. Do you see that? So that's pretty cool because now we could take both of those leaves and like one is coming up and one is going down. So it just gives it a little, a little design. So there's no right or wrong. I'm telling you, you guys are going to, to really enjoy the process when you, when you start shaping. If this is your thing, okay? It may not be your thing. You might just be like, forget it. All right, so next I want to add some color. Now, obviously if I went in and tried to use uh, an ink blending tool or something of regulation size, it would be a bit challenging. And I don't use these tools often, but I do use them for, well, their purpose. These are called detail blending tools. I call them blending pegs, but it's just like a dowel with the Ranger blending foam like stuck on it. It's glued on. So these aren't removable, interchangeable. Um, I don't even wash them because I think they would totally disintegrate, but you get foam on each end. I keep mine in the mini distress tin. They're like a box of little inky crayons. And you'll see, like I have just there we go, that was better. Like different ones for different colors. I don't have one for each color, I just, I just don't. So I'm gonna, I'll pull them out like, I'm gonna use pink, so I'll take a pink one, and let's look for a dirty brown one. There we go, a little dirty brown one, I'll take those, okay? And these are just nice, and you'll see why, because this is going to allow me to do a couple of things. Well one, let's say you wanted a little bit more pink, right? I can just take this, this one I just, you pounce right on there. And let's say you wanted a little bit more pink on your petals. Watch what happens. It just allows me to go in right on the edge and just add that little pop of color. Not a lot, but you see how it just adds more pink. And if you want more, you can go in there. And the nice thing is that because it's detailed, you're not trying to ink something so small with that big foam and you're getting ink everywhere. This is, again, for the detail. So now I've got those nice Kitsch Flamingo tips, but if we want to grunge it up a little bit, you can. Uh, if you go grunge, especially on flowers, stick to something light. Maybe pumice stone is your jam or uh, frayed burlap. But you know, if you go too grungy, too much of the dark side, then your flower is going to look more dead than alive. But maybe that's your thing, right? 
So the cool thing about this is the shape. You can see that I can also take that and color the top. And some people say, well, can you ink it before you shape it? You could, absolutely, but I always like to do it afterwards because the paper gets its own little creases and uh, texture from shaping, and I always think that ink looks better on a textured surface, right? Like the wrinkles take a little bit more color than not, but see how easy this is? It's so easy. I'm, I'm sure it's not even focusing because I'm working so fast, but really, it, it's just easy. It's super easy to do. Now for the leaves, well, the leaves I'm just going to go into a darker one, so I'll just flip that over. And here's what I like to do on this. If we're gonna add some color, the nice thing about these detail is I can also just rub them over the surface and look at just that little shadow. So that's the other nice thing about these versus, cause you might say, well, can't you just use a paintbrush or water brush? Yes, but then it's gonna look watercolored and not blended. So look at that, where it just adds that little bit of age. Mmm, that's what I like. So again, it's just about finding tools that work for you. And these, I think, come in like a pack of five. So I just got a few of them and threw them in a tin because I don't, again, I don't want to be bothered with labeling them and writing on them, but you do you. Okay, so now I've got pieces, right? I've got pieces right here for a flower. I've done some inking and we're going to put it together. So when we go to put it together, we have, again, we have options. You can glue this, right? You can use glue dots. You can do whatever you want. But if you want to add a little stamen, and I had to Google what this whole thing was, I like the idea of adding a little bit. And again, I don't know if that one even goes with that flower, and I don't care, right? It's just going to add something, I don't know, botanically. So here's, here's what I did. Um, and by me, I mean Mario, because I had to send him on a little, this was last night. I'm like, we need to find these little things. Okay, so we went to the craft store to find these little stamen things, I, I guess. I mean, I always thought they were used for florals, but this was actually in the bakery department because maybe use them on cakes. And this pack came with like two different kinds. This one had this little uh, bumpity nuggety bit, and this one had this little teardrop shiny pearly bit. Okay, but both of them, they're dual tipped and they're wired. Now you can use them as is right out of the package, but they only came in white. Or you can take your favorite colors of alcohol ink, sit down like I did, and just make a mixed bag of whatever colors you want. It was very, very simple to alcohol ink all of them. And all I did was I grouped a whole pile together of whatever the same color was, right? So let's say I was going to do pink. I grabbed them right in the middle. I placed it over a paper towel. I took my bottle of ink, drip, 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 turned it over, drip, 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 and laid it down. And like the ink comes right out from the bottle, so I'm not squeezing it. But I like the fact that see how it hit some of the areas and some of the areas it didn't, you need to do alcohol ink because, I don't know, these are made out of some styrofoamy stuff. So distress ink wouldn't work. Probably paint, but not ink. So what I'm going to do is I'll use one of them. I'll just use, I'll use a yellow one for this. How about that? Okay, because I like how that looked now that I dumped them all over. The other thing I've, I learned is try to keep them like the way they come because the middle part is wire. And maybe you can get these in different colors. I have no idea, but um, alcohol ink sure was, sure was easy. And I'll post these um, on the blog recap so you can see the colors I chose. There's no right or wrong. Again, some people will probably have way better suggestions on making them look more realistic, but it was certainly simple for me to just take those and add some ink. And that's what I want to do to put my flower together. So I've got my stamen, I've got my sculpting mat, and I have a glue gun over here, okay? talked about glue guns in the past, but I've got this on, it's ready to go. So here's what I'm going to do. First, I need to pierce a hole through all of these, and here's what I've found. Again, you can use your craft pick, whatever you have. But I'm going to take this. Now, this isn't really a piercing mat, so don't use the middle of it to poke holes because it's not what it's for, but I know that I'm never going to sculpt on the corner of my mat. That's just not going to give me enough movement, so I just use the corner of my mat. I take my die pick, right, and I just start by, like, poking the center, picking it up, but look at the end of the die pick. See how it's rounded? It's almost rounded perfect that I can take this, push that all the way to the top because this is getting a bigger diameter and this diameter is perfect for a dual layer of that stamen wire. So again, I just pierce just to make that opening, twist this all the way up and see, I like the fact that I can shape that flower around that die pick. Boy, this zoomy thing is something. I kind of forget that it zoomed in so I, I bring it so close. And I'll show you like what it's doing to the 
the cushion. But the cushion seems to like recover well. I just don't think it's a good idea to poke right in the middle of it. That's just a preference. Okay, same thing. Pierce that, pick that up. Let's see, again, I can go in and just give that flower a little bit more shape. So now I've got a hole through all of those. I don't need to pierce the leaves. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take this and I'm going to fold it in half. And again, you don't have to do it this way. You can just cut these off and glue them yourself. Go for it. But I'm just gonna have that little fold. And I will start by taking the smallest flower, taking the fold of that wire and threading it up. So I have no glue at this point. I've just put that up near the top because I, what I don't wanna see is glue. Let me get my hand there so it can focus. There we go. I don't want glue in the center of my flower, so I don't start with glue. I mean, it's just gonna look like sap or honey. I don't know what it's gonna look like, but I just start there. Then I'm going to put glue on the back. So I need to work kind of quickly, so I'll talk about what I'm gonna do. Each layer, I'm gonna put a dab of glue underneath the layer I did on this wire. This way, when I push the next flower up, I can stop anywhere I want on that wire to give it more openness, right? If everything is just sh shoved up to the top, your flower is just gonna look like a head of cabbage. Again, perfectly fine. But just so you know what I'm doing, all right? So I'll try to show you, but I don't do much of the glue gun. Here, let me just, if I have my nonstick mat here, then I could lay it on the nonstick mat. There we go. All right, so we're gonna go in, we're gonna add a little bit of glue. So I just take the detail tip of that glue, I love that trigger. I wrap it around the wire just to get rid of the glue string. You take the next size, put that on. I kind of need to pinch that. Come on, Tim. I can't see. I need to bring it up closer to my face. Sorry, guys. I can't see to thread a hole. Old Mario. That's it. 50 and my eyes are gone. All right. No. But I, just have, I normally work closer to my face. All right. So there's my second layer. And see, by having that glue in the middle, I was able to create a gap which I like. Okay, we're just gonna keep going. So next, next little dot of glue. And so what it's doing is it's kind of supporting the previous layer and securing the next layer. And it's really just a dot. Could you use something other than hot glue? I'm sure you could, but you would just have to wait a little bit in between the drying. So now I'm gonna pull that one. Nice, I like that. So far so good. I'll hold that there, a little bit more glue. So it's just a dot. Again, go around just to get rid of your glue strings and feed that through. Again, sometimes you just have to, there we go. And when I layer this, I kind of want the petals to be offset a little bit. So see how I just kind of turn that to where the big one is in between those other two? Again, whatever you want to do, that's fine. And then once you're done with it, I put one little bit of glue just to kind of keep it all there. Okay. So that's our flower, easy enough. And so you can imagine from a compartmental crafting idea, meaning you've already inked your paper, that was one day. Then one day you sat and you die cut a bunch of little things. Maybe you put them in little Ziploc bags, maybe you put them in portion cups by flowers, maybe you did them by size, whatever worked for you. Then you went in and just shaped them all one night, watching TV, you do shaping, whatever. Then you're like, okay, I'm gonna come in, get my glue gun out, and I'm going to build the flowers. By doing this, then you're gonna have this pile of flowers, a pile of flowers that when you want to do your make or do your card, they're ready to go versus what I used to do as a maker is I would sit down and go, I have to make a card or I have to make this. And I would have to get out all those things to do to make a background, to stamp, to water. And my cards would really be, well, they'd be lazy because I wouldn't want to put in the work because usually I was going somewhere and I needed something right away or I forgot someone's birthday. I needed to get it out. And so I really wasn't doing my best work. And all the stuff that I had in my craft room wasn't being put to use because I just didn't have time to use it. And so that's why my, my way of making is just, it's more of a playful thing. And then when you need to have a card, man, everything's there. I've got backgrounds to pull from, stamp things, flowers, and it just looks like you spent hours to do it. And you probably did over the course of time, but not this time. So next we're gonna add the leaves. And so I'll just take my leaf. This one, I add a little bit of glue to the end of the leaf. You know, nice little, I'll try to show you. See, kind of like a bead of that. Because what I want to do is I want to take the flower and see where do I want to put that leaf. So I just, using my finger, I'll just touch that just so I can see where that leaf is. Beautiful. See, so much fun. Gosh, who knew paper could be? I didn't. I mean, really, what's happening, Mario? I went from like launching a pink color to making flowers in the same week. Holy moly. But 
you know, once you have the right tools, it's just fun. And yes, do I see grungy flowers with steampunk centers and uh, fasteners? You bet I do. But still, this is very cool, especially for Valentine's Day and spring uh, and Easter coming up. Look at that. Just beautiful. And that flower is done. And maybe you don't add the leaves until the end, right? But when those are done, they just, they go in a container. So now I got a container of flowers. Super simple, right? Super simple. Okay. Any questions on that? I, I'm watching the chat and I think you guys kind of kind of get it. It's it's super easy. And yes, these guys, these could just be flowers on a card. This is this with a button. This is this with a button. And this is what I like about, you know, taking that detail tool. And you can see when I take the tool that sometimes I'll go, gosh, focus. The camera doesn't want to focus. I'll just go like back and forth. Or It's very interesting on how we can add uh, color to these just using this. You just get a lot more control with uh, your ink blending with the detail tool. You probably, I mean, you probably have never seen me use these because they're not for backgrounds or going along. To me, they're just not for that. But for detail things, they're perfect. Okay, so those were the flowers of that set. Now let's talk about this little guy because I do uh, love these. This is all from that same die set. I'll bring this in for those of you that join it. This is an older die set. I'm not, I think it's still available, but it's a really good die set because you get the ability to either have single layers or multi layers. And I'm showing you that before we get into the quilled one, but look at this. So this flower is that like in between, remember I talked about the petals. So this blue one is actually the pink one I just did. And this blue one is actually the pink one because I like to confuse you, but see by having a shorter petal, then that's really nice because you get just a little, just a different kind of flower, I think, just a different kind, all right? This one, that whole kind of daisy style, so neat, and this is great. I'm gonna, I'll actually do this one because I really I wanna show you. I got all my pieces here. Okay, so I'm just going to take this, I'm gonna place these down, face down because I wanna spray the back, but no right or wrong. If you spray the wrong side, honestly, it doesn't matter. You'll just know when you're shaping what you wanna do. Okay, so same rules apply for me, meaning I'm always going to start with that tiny tip. I'm just going to push just the very end of these guys, okay? This one's really awesome. <laughs> it's just magic, okay. So this one is just gonna be different, I'll show you, because I've got this, I've got this. Okay, so can you see how those have already started to curve up? This one's gonna be an any versus an Audi. This one's an Audi. So the Innie is going to, I'll flip the tools and watch what happens. I'm just going to pull it one time. That's it. I don't need to, it's not back and forth. It's literally dragging it over. It's like curling ribbon. And then I'm going to do the same thing to make that little cup. And now I've got this little flower shape. So by tucking them in this way, I'm just getting a different shape flower. Okay. So same thing. I can take all these because when it gets to the smaller ones, it goes super fast because you're just pushing the tip with that smallest end of the stylus. That's why you want all those. And then dragging that in and circle. See, it's so fast. Okay, this these guys go really quick because you pretty much just look at it and it starts to curve up. Okay. I still need to use this end. You'll know if it's not working. There we go. You'll know. So even this guy, you can still add dimension even to, so even if you're only gonna use small flowers, I see this die used a lot, especially now with like Oliver. See how you can just take that? This on a card, absolutely charming because it just gave a curve and a contour. It's not like you went in and just bent each petal up with your finger, right? That's the difference. So again, these could all be stacked. I'm not gonna go in and do it because I've got many other things to show you. Do the stamen and then we would have this flower. Do your inking. Could you do your inking after you build it? Absolutely. So if you forget to add ink the first time, you can always go back when your flower is done and you could still go in and just, you know, add your highlights here and there with your detail tools. So don't, don't panic too much if you don't really like the way something is. All right, let me get to this next one. Talk about shaping. Let's talk about this particular die. Let's say you have the one with the quilling, okay? What's cool about this is, I'll be honest, I was, I told you, it's kind of a love-hate because when you cut these out, this is a spiral. And when you go to, to curl these up with a quilling tool, they just looked really rigid, 
right? But these, I mean, look at that shape. Look at how cool that is. Beautiful. Here's how easy these are, okay? I'll just do one. I'll just do the rows. But you can see for this one, you're able to e either get that flower that's kind of all closed in, or if we did it the other way, that flower would have bloomed open. No right or wrong. Okay, so I'm going to take, and again, that's the one, that's this guy. So what I'm going to do is I'll take this, and I know that I want, this is going to be the front, right? So that's the color that I want to see, but I'm going to be sculpting because I want these petals to all come this way. So I'm actually going to spray my water on the front of this, place it down, wet side down. I'm just going to take the tool, and same thing, I'm just using that just right on the tips of these. Now watch what's happening as I'm doing this. Do you see how that paper is curling? So right away, for those that have ever made one of these and you just have trouble with the paper relaxing, just so you can curl that around, you're like, okay, already I see something cool happening. But here's what, here's what you need to notice. So I've got to get this out of my way as I keep going. So sometimes I'll need to hold this. I'm going to go all the way around, but I don't do the biggest one in the middle because that's kind of the landing pad. So again, I'm just using that and I'm just pressing that down. Now on the bigger ones, I still want to give it that little, I don't know, that little extra oomph. So I'm just going to take the ball of this, that bigger one. And these are just paper, like paper shrapnel that comes from die cutting. So don't worry about that. But I'm just taking that and same thing. I'm pushing that right on that bigger area of just the bigger petals just to give it a little bit more shape. Okay. So at this point, this is what you have. It just looks like a mess, kind of like a noodly mess. But we want our petals to go over. So here's what we need to do, okay? We're gonna open this back up, how it needs to be. And now I'm going to start on the edge and I'm going to go the opposite way because this is the way that I want it to curve, right? So I'm just taking that and I'm not adding a lot of pressure. I'm just trying to go slow so you can see that by going along that edge, we're changing the direction of the spiral, the curve. So now my petals are going over the way that I want them to go. And I just go all the way around. Not a lot of pressure, you'll see. Okay, done, it's ready to go. So here's how we do the rows. See, that was so stinking fast when it comes to, to sculpting. Okay, so for this rose, could you go in and ink it? Yeah, but this one's so much easier to ink when you're all said and done, it is way, way easier. I'm trying to pay attention to the chat, Mario, so I hope everything is going okay. Because sometimes I just get in it. Are we doing okay? I just see a question from Judy. Do you have to use watercolor cardstock or can you use regular cardstock? You can use whatever paper you want, but I'm using watercolor because I feel that it gives me the best result. So. Yeah, it's something like the chat is just super, super fast and comments are coming and cool. going. Cool, yeah. So I've been doing distressed watercolor cardstock, which is 118 pound. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the demo, you can use whatever paper you have and try. But the thinner the paper, the less flexibility it's going to have because you could pierce through it or rip through it. But try it. You know, you might have the perfect paper. I've just found that like 100 pound or heavier is kind of my go-to. That's just what I, what I prefer. Okay. So here's how this one's going to go together, because you might look at that and go, well, wait a minute, this is where you had that quilling tool, right? So what I'm going to use are the squeezers, okay? I'm going to take these guys, <laughs> yeah, because they're super sharp, super pointy, and you squeeze to open them, but they've got an amazing grip. So first thing, I'm just going to squeeze and release and grab that. Oh my gosh, so much easier than when I was doing a quilling tool. And I'm just going to wrap this around. Again, I'm not I'm not trying to form my flower on this. I'm just using the tweezer. And I like the fact that this actually gets, get my finger out of the way. See how it gets wider, the tweezer? So I'm just, this is not tight. I'm not winding this tight at all. I'm just going around, going around. Just think of it like twirling pasta on a fork, okay? And it's just, again, it's a hot mess, but that's okay because we got it the direction we want. Then we're just gonna take this, we're gonna squeeze, and we're gonna release. So easy. Okay, this is where things, it's where the magic happens. So at this point, once you let it go, you can see already that we have a rose. I mean already, but we need to get it to, uh, to be secure. So what I'm going to do now is I'll take my tweezer and now I'm gonna go in from the top and grab the center. So I'm gonna open that and grab the center. Do you see that? That's how I have it. Okay, 
Then I'm going to work uh, on the mat with some glue. So I'll do some hot glue and I'm going to take, there's like, I'll try to keep this in frame. Okay, this is pretty important. So you have this landing pad. You see, that's like the biggest part, that little center. That's where the glue is going, but it's also going to go in this big opening. So that's why I want to work on my nonstick mat. I'm going to be pretty generous with the glue because that's what's going to hold everything together. So give yourself like a nice blob of glue, if you will. Oop. Hold that together, Tim. And now I can take my squeezer. I can make the center as tight as I want. I can push everything down into that glue. Again, my tweezer is holding that flower so it's not unraveling. It's allowing me now to, to go in and easily push those petals out, right? Because we've already shaped them. So it's not like you're trying to go in and just smash the paper. And then once you're happy with it, you're gonna squeeze and release. No glue, it's perfectly clean. And now your flower is just drying. You wanna let that sit there so it can dry, right? We want that, that glue ball under there to do it. So if, if I turn this over now, you'll see. You see that blob of glue? That's what's holding everything together. Now, if you want the middle to be brighter like, I, like that, you could just go in with your detail blending tool and do your inking. So simple. So, so simple. So that's it, you put the cap back on. I just like that. Really, really simple. <laughs> that's it. The, once this is done, you're just gonna take some hot glue. You're gonna glue the petals just like we did the other flowers. I mean, honestly, it couldn't be, couldn't be easier, right? Really simple. <laughs> that's what I like. So how long does it take to cool? It just doesn't really take long. I just kind of see if it wants to lift, and it does. Perfect. Get rid of those little glue strings. Look at that. Let's take a little bit of that detail blending tool. So you got a little bit, look at that. Little kitsch flamingo right on the ends. We'll also take whatever brown is left just to give a little aging. You know how beautiful is that? And especially if you had just had like a whole pile of them. That's it. A whole little pile. And you could shape these really how, however much you want. If you want a tighter rosebud, then when you were going in and doing your flowers, right? So when I was doing the hot glue dismount, when you stick the flower down, you would just twist this and you'd see the flower become tighter and that's what would create a smaller rosebud. But of course this one, you know, there's also different size roses. So you can also make just different size ones depending on the dye if you were going in for smaller ones. So just some ideas, okay. We are moving on from these flowers and talk about some other things. Because there's other things that we have the ability to shape. So some other things that we have the ability to shape, insects, right? I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna actually see if I can zoom out, so bear with me. Oh boy, that didn't work. There we go, okay. So creating shapes like for insects, whether you have entomology and you have the matching framelits, whether you have this new specimen and you want your that moth or butterfly to be huge, or maybe you have flutter, right? So any of these, it's a great way to use your stamped images to give it shape. So here we have, and I've demoed, you know, ways that you can uh, use your your framelits and your your matching dies. But take a look at this. Take the ability to have, say, these insects, okay, which are normally flat and color them and shape them so they have depth. So putting these in a shadow box, putting these even on a card, now all the wings have the shape. Even on these little guys, like this guy, see I wanted his wings to have to curl in, right? So all I did on that one is I just inked just the back that was visible. Super simple. So these are all starting out by Stamping and die cutting, again, very systematic. I normally die cut first and then stamp later. There's a little uh, hack using a stamp tool that I've shared. Same thing with butterflies. So I have a whole bowl of them. And if you have them already cut, there again, you could sit down one night and do all your coloring, and then we could go in and shape them. Coloring is exactly the same way I sh showed before. Take your ink pads, take your brush. This time it's just a detailer, and we go in and color, and then we shape. So let's just take one real quick. And just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna get uh, too involved, but you could, you could really add whatever colors you want with this. So let's just take this guy. I'll smash a little bit of that ink on there. Let me take a little brush, if I can find mine. 
Here we are. I gotta get rid of these stamens. Okay. So let's just say you did a beautiful coloring job. <laughs> that is beautiful. Okay, it's not about that, but I would do all of my coloring first. Then we're just going to go in and shape it. And shaping it, super simple, okay? This is gonna require the bigger ones. So these guys that we haven't really used much on those tiny flowers because, well, they're tiny, we need it just because these are bigger pieces. So for this, I would let this dry, but because it's already wet from water coloring, well, I'm good to go. I'm just gonna place that down. I'm still gonna start with just that small one, just on those tips that I wanna have a little bit more of a curl. Not much though, because it's not a flower petal. Then I'm gonna to switch to this. And again, just on the tips, use the smallest ball, or I'm sorry, the, the bigger ball and the smallest tool. Then we go to this one, because we wanna make sure that we're shaping this. So I'll start with the next size. And again, just work in that area. And you can see that it just glides over the paper. And you'll, you'll also notice just how much depth this already gives. Switch to this big one, pull that in, pull that in. Now I'm just using the bigger one. And I'm just, you can see what's happening. You're getting that cup shape. Now, this is still the back of the butterfly. And right now it's a bowl. So what we need to do is turn it over. And depending on the body size of whatever it is you're doing, this is smaller, but if it was specimen, it would be bigger. We're gonna take that and we're gonna go right down the body and it just makes those wings stand up. So this allows that flat area for you to glue, but now your wings come up. If you don't go down with the body, then you'll have nowhere to glue it. And you'll see that when they dry, I mean, they maintain their shape, even thrown in a bowl or a bag. So you can do so many different things with uh, your butterflies, your insects, even if you're gonna add a little bit of uh, dimension, like on your wings, you, can, you don't have to, you know, I just went in and kind of curved these guys. Just super, super simple, right? That to me is, is great. What are the chances of dyes for a specimen? Zero, zero. So that, that's gonna be a cutting one. Um, yeah, probably won't see many, many framelits for, for stamps for a while. So there we are. So that's a great way that we can take our stamps and create some shape, create some contour. So I think there's, there's just a lot of ways that we can use the shaping kit. I, Again, it is one of those things that you look at it and you're like, I don't even know if I'd ever use it. Well, it's pretty cool. So let me just do one more thing just with this big one, just to give you an idea, because we haven't worked with something so big. And then we're gonna wrap this up. So when it comes to something that is dimensional, right? Detailed like this, that has layers, because we haven't talked about that. Normally I would go in and I would ink the layers first, right? Do the little pieces just so I can get a little shadow. Again, going in with the detail blending tool, right? Just to add, little highlight to the edge. And then following the design, because these actually, I don't know if the camera's gonna pick it up, but they actually have crease rule as to where you would you place these layers. I would go in and layer them first. So I would do all of my layering. And this, I would use something flexible. I prefer something like collage medium um, over adhesive sheets if I know I'm going to shape it. Uh, if I'm gonna keep it flat, I don't mind using you know adhesive sheets or tape, but if it's going to be something sculpted, I wanna use collage medium because one, it's gonna dry really quick, and two, when it's done, it's going to be flexible and it's not gonna to wanna to pop off. Tape is going to to wanna to pop off. So some sort of liquid adhesive is going to be best. And then once everything is built, and I say built because if you look at these, you see how it has those layers. I would build this, and then I would just build the center. So that's gonna be this yellow layer and this brown layer. And I'll have finished ones on my blog after the live so you can see how this ended up. Uh, I would ink this. This one, I'm gonna wanna give it shape so it's more like a bowl, you know, so it's like the center of a flower. And these petals I also wanna shape, okay? So what I'm going to do with this one is I'll take it, I'm just gonna give a little mist of water, just off camera, just so I have it, all right? And I'll just go in with the large ones and I can just add some shape. So remember, if you just wanna add a little bit of dimension to a die cut, don't think you have to always go in and create that really harsh curve, right? That's what the small one is. Remember how we did on the tips of the petals? This is saying, okay, I have a large flower like this, these beautiful, beautiful brushstroke flowers, or maybe it's pine or whatever, and I'm using the largest ball. That's why I really wanted that on here. And I've just given it a little bit of shape, 
If I do that same circular motion, it's just going to kind of bring things together. Look at that. So it's not, it's not overkill. It's not just all curled into itself. You could certainly do that, but this is going to be really nice, especially if you go in and layer. So like for the, the center, again, I would have already had this built and I will build it. Um, but I'm just going to take whatever ball is going to be proportionate to this piece and just give it some shape. Just always go from the outside pulling into the center. Again, go in that circular motion. And that inside there with a little ink, I mean, you could see the ability to add dimension even to big things, right? So I wanted to try to show the versatility. That's why I wanted to do uh, this demo to kind of kick off uh, spring. There's plenty of time, of course, for Valentine's if you're going to make, uh, you know, stunning flowers. So many beautiful little flowers for your makes. But it's, it's nice to know how you can use it beyond just the flower tool. And that's really what I always thought it was. I'm like, well, I don't, what if I don't do a lot of flowers? But adding just some dimension. So if you have like the transparent wings, you can do this on the back of acetate as well, right? You wouldn't need to wet that because it's plastic, but it's also going to give it shape because of these tools really give you the flexibility and this mat. So I encourage you to, to play. Hopefully you found this inspiring, at least one, one element of it. Maybe it's not your jam, but you know, even if you didn't want to do any of the shaping, you might just like the idea of, of all of our inked backgrounds. So a fun way to kind of kick off our demo Saturdays. Hope you guys liked it. We're going to kind of wrap this up and see if you have any questions or anything of, you know, maybe things that I don't. But yeah, if you, if you don't have this, die, like I said, it, it might still be available, but I like its flexibility of building smaller flowers or un, unlayered flowers. But I also I got to say, these little things, now that I don't use this thing that I never use, a quilling tool, it's just nice uh, with the little, the little tweezers. They're good. I just use them a lot because um, I get a little shaky because I have too much coffee when I'm making. And, <laughs> and tweezers that I actually have to remember to squeeze together. Yeah, like I said, some people like the other ones. And this, I just like the fact that once I, once I have something, like let's say I'm going to glue this, I just like the fact that I don't have to have any pressure. I can put my glue on, set it down, and then once I'm happy with it, I can just release it and off we go. So, all right. That was good fun. Good Good fun. All right, we're going to switch cameras back and yeah, I won't tangle myself in the mic. <laughs> That's good. Not bad, huh? Yeah, you did great. It's good. It's good, good fun. It's super clear and the sound is really good. Excellent. Good. We're trying. Yeah. So, what's not good is uh -oh. Well, oh. the platform. <laughs> like, we're learning the platform mm -hmm. and apparently, like, comments, I don't know why, but like, comments were being deleted and then it would say comments were being retracted.